So my name is Lisa Martin, and I, um, I started this organization, Healthy Climate Communities, six years ago um, out of a concern about climate change. And I found while going into schools to do workshops that um, some teachers had a real interest in the topic, but they didn't have enough background knowledge or confidence in their ability to teach it. And so this, um, and the other issue was a lot of schools, especially DOE schools, the teachers are so busy and have so many requirements that they have to do that I wanted to make sure there was an option um, for teaching this topic that isn't extra or enrichment, but actually targets exactly the standards that need to be taught in class so that it's not putting you know, extra time or work on the teachers, but is actually meeting you know, what they are required to teach. So we did target NGSS very, very specifically with the fifth grade standards. And, um, but I think we'll start out with just going around and everybody can introduce themselves. Um, if we, I know everyone's screens might look different. So maybe we'll start with Lorna and then we'll just go around on my screen. Okay, hi everybody. I'm a former DOE teacher. I um, spent 14 years at Ka'ohau, which is the former Lanikai over in Kailua. And I've taught second, third and fourth grade mostly, mostly fourth grade. And then about three years ago, I joined the district office at Kailua Kalaheo and I became a full release mentor with them. So my job was to assist beginning teachers that are new to the profession in their first and second years. Um, so that ended with this past school year and I became eligible to retire. So I took advantage of it. And then Lisa called me the next day and said, do you wanna come and work with her? <laughs> so I've been busy with this. And also I um, am an adjunct teacher over at Chaminade. So I'm also with pre-service teachers as well. So I'm excited to guide you through the process and help you with your portfolio. And it's an amazing resource that Lisa has provided for everyone. And the best part, it's all free. So enjoy the ride and thank you for being here. Let's just begin with the agenda today. Um, we all just met each other. Our guest speaker, Laren Lerma, she got confused and thought our meeting started at four. So we're gonna push her back a little bit um, because she's on her way driving home. So she has already used the program. So she, she's going to share with you um, her thoughts and experiences on it. And um, Lisa, do you want me to jump ahead to the portfolio requirements or save that till the end? I think you're muted, hold on. Um, either way, I can, I can start. I had wanted to um, follow Laren so I could see what she said and- I can talk a little bit about yeah, it then. And add okay. to that or not, yeah. depending on what she covered. That's fine. Okay, so um, how many of you have never turned in a portfolio before? Is anybody a first timer on that? I am. Okay, Judy. Judy. Okay, not too, not too bad then. Because um, it can be kind of daunting, but I'm gonna try to make it as easy for you. So, Let's just talk a little bit about the purpose of the portfolio. So the primary purpose is to measure the effectiveness of the course in, deep, in the deepening of participant learning and the enhancement of your practice. So the content and construction may vary, but the portfolio is shaped by the purpose of the course. In this case, the purpose of our course is to help you implement your NGSS standards so we'll be um, kind of focused on that as the overall objective. So these are our, our outcomes for the program. Um, some of them are very detailed, like the first one is talking about developing a model to use an, as an example to describe ways that the spheres interact with each other. Now that could sound really daunting, but it could be something as simple as cardboard cutouts and the kids will hold it up and one of them will be the atmosphere, the other, another one will be the hydrosphere. 
So don't let that kind of um, think that, oh my gosh, what she mean by model? You know, it sounds so daunting, but we're, we're, we're here to help simplify it for you and to just give you some ideas. And you probably have some great ideas already. Okay, the next one is to obtain, evaluate, and communicate information to explain phenomena and solutions to a design problem. And Lisa will go into detail what that means. That's very scientific sounding. Um, another one is to observe patterns in nature and prompt questions about relationships and underlying causes. That's a really good one when we talk to kids about the flooding that's going on in certain parts of the country or the drought. And so if you make them aware of why those things are happening and how can we help change the course of the um, pattern, that would be awesome. The next one is to obtain and uh, combine information about ways individual communities use science to protect the Earth's resources. Identify the negative effects of human interference in the carbon cycle and how they can be reduced. And lastly, to design possible solutions to reduce the carbon footprint by planting trees in your ahupua. So what's required of you is to attend all required course sessions. Um, there are actually five to our sessions. I don't know why that says four, I'll correct that. Um, teach all five lessons as provided in the unit overview. So not, luckily in other PD classes, you had to come up with your own lessons. Lisa has created a wonderful curriculum here. So your job is to teach the lesson and then you're going to report back on what happened, what, what were the results of that. So there's three parts. You're gonna report back on how it went. You're gonna show us work samples from students and you're gonna reflect on how you felt the lesson went and what could you do differently the next time you teach it, okay? And again, so, with that, you may be adapting it right. if you are teaching a different age group or a different skill level, and that's fine. Yeah, or even with sped kids, right? If you're like in, in an environment that's not with a large group. Okay, so, you're, so that's what I just covered here. Show student work, reflect and caption learning on each lesson. You're also gonna participate with each other in collaborative conversations that provide opportunities to interact, network exchange. And then you're gonna provide specific and meaningful meet, feedback to peers. So this is our schedule. Um, it's pretty laid out clearly. I think the portfolio is due after spring break. So I'm sorry that it went ahead on me. So that will be very helpful when you're working on it in the last couple of days. And this screen is just showing you an example of um, how to conduct a collaborative conversation. So I'm gonna share all of these resources with you but I just wanted to share an example. And then also we're going to break you up into breakout rooms in the subsequent um, sessions. And that is one way for you to document a collaborative conversation as well. So this could be a simple recording and then you could actually attach it into your portfolio. Or you could just chat with each other too, whatever works best for you, whatever communication style you feel comfortable with. Okay, so here's what's going to be in your learning um, results portfolio, also known as the LRP. So you're gonna start with an initial introduction and then you're going to do these three things that I mentioned earlier, report on your results of your lesson taught, work student work samples and reflections. And you'll do that for all five lessons. And then after that, you'll be documenting four uh, collaborative conversations doing a culminating reflection and making sure you've satisfied everything on the checklist. So here is a suggestion on um, what they mean by logging collaborative conversations. It's pretty much, um, you know, it's pretty much gonna tell you that you need to go a little bit deeper than just saying, oh, like, you know, it shows my team and I in a collaborative conversation. They want a more than that, yeah. So um, we'll discuss later on how to assess the substance of your conversations. I guess it's more, if we go back to that previous 
one and, and I can share that document with you just to add, add asking the right questions. So it doesn't turn into just sort of like a trivial in, you know, interchange. So here's a good example of a collaborative conversation. So teacher one was kind of talking about um, peer and self-assessing and then teacher two, he's not only um, agreeing with him, but he's saying why he also agreed. So that's a good example of, of an, a collaborative conversation. So this, um, this is just the first page of the portfolio template <clears throat> that you're gonna be using. And I'm going to probably upload it to a Google Classroom doc so that way you can work from there and attach all of your um, artifacts that way. So once I get everybody's personal email, I'll create a group for our class and then uh, we'll go from there. So to, I'm, I'm going to follow up with the checklist, the LRP checklist, the template for your portfolio and the participant agreement. So the participant agreement is just basically reiterating that you will, you, you know, you agree to satisfy all the requirements of the course. So that was kind of it in a nutshell. I went a little fast, but does anyone have any questions right off the bat? Um, sorry, LRP, is that like the lesson? What does that stand for again? The LRP stands for your <laughs> learning results portfolio. So that's what you turn in to get your three credits from um, PD3, yeah. And um, like I said, I was able to obtain a standardized template for it. So everyone's portfolio should look similar. And um, I can show you samples of it the next time too, if, if anybody wants to see that, but it's pretty self-explanatory. If you've done one before too, it should be okay. Okay, no other questions. We, as we get more into it, I'm sure somebody might have an additional question on it. Okay, so as we're still waiting for our- Well, no, I, um, I will, if, if it's okay, I'll go ahead and I'll do an overview of, um, of climate change issues. And okay. part of this is just for you folks to have confidence while you're teaching that you have a good understanding not everything in the PowerPoint we're about to go through is something that you would necessarily teach your kids, but you may have you know, curious kids that ask about things beyond the scope of just what you're teaching. And so I want you to have confidence in your own understanding. And then secondly, it is just to remind you folks what an important topic you are teaching and taking on. And I'm so grateful for that choice. Um, my only concern is that while I'm doing that, I don't know if I will be able to see Laren coming into the waiting room. So if she appears, um, please let me know. <laughs> and Savita, did you have a question? We're a small group. Anyone can unmute at any time to um, oh, well, I to didn't speak. want to be rude. <laughs> so yeah. Um, yeah, so um, uh, you know the uh, lesson plan you're talking about. So. Uh, sometimes if I want to front load some, you know, vocabulary for the ELL or do something little modification, I just need to uh, mention that in the lesson plan that I modified this part to this. Is that okay? Or, uh, or how do you want that to? Yeah, so when you um, report the results of how it went when you taught the lesson plan, that would be a good time to to talk about the modifications. Oh, okay. So when you're, you know, it's the first part, like like I use portions of lesson number one and the reason for that is because of the level of my students or something like that. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. sure. Okay, so I am going to share my screen and um, let's see how it goes. Okay, so I hope you folks are seeing just a, a single slide there now. Is that right? Okay. Yes. So we're just going to do an overview on climate change. This is something that is 
you know, not something that will affect future generations, it's affecting us now. And the way that it is taught in this unit, so what I want to remind everyone of who, who hasn't taken high school biology for a very long time is the carbon cycle. And that is a really simple way to think of the cause of climate change. And so basically we have changed the carbon cycle. And this is something taken out of the lesson. This is a simple model that shows um, the carbon cycle. Basically um, plants are always doing photosynthesis and they do the photosynthesis by using energy from the sun, taking in water and taking in carbon dioxide. And with those three ingredients, they you know, create sugar, which is our basic, you know, the food. And animals who do not do photosynthesis, they consume plants or consume other animals that consume plants. And that's how they get carbon into their bodies, right? Because we are made up of about 50% carbon. If you take the water out of us, the rest would be mostly calcium from our bones and teeth. But living things by definition are made of carbon. And when the earth was formed, there was a certain amount of carbon and no new carbon has ever been created. None has been lost. It just, it cycles around. Part of it cycles and part of it is, is stored in what we call carbon sinks. So when the carbon is taken in from the atmosphere into the biosphere, which is all living things, either through photosynthesis or consumption, then it's also released back into the other part of the cycle through respiration. Plants and animals both respire, which is just breathing out. Decomposition, when they die, they rot or they would burn, combustion. So that's kind of our natural carbon cycle. And what, you know, one thing that we have changed um, is land use. And that impacts all the photosynthesis and all the carbon, the amount of carbon that is stored in the biosphere. So this is a little video of the Amazon and it's just showing over a 24 year period, which is a very short amount of time, how we have changed the biosphere so dramatically. In this case, mostly clearing forest for um, cattle farming for export beef for in Brazil. And that just means there is less of a sink, a place to store carbon in the biosphere, because across the world, as our population has increased so dramatically, we've had to clear a lot of forests for places to live, cities and towns, as well as agriculture to feed us all. So that's one big change. The other change, which is even bigger, has, has changed the carbon um, cycle even more, is fossil fuel combustion. And so this is showing the same, this is showing that when we take oil, and in this, because this is from our lesson and Hawaii does not have any fossil fuels, um, we import our oil, you know, in ships. And when we burn that oil, whether it's in cars or making power, then we release that carbon back into the atmosphere. And the fossil fuels were stored underground. They're called fossils because they're so old. And that's just living things, you know, um, probably mostly plant material that got covered up in water and compressed under the ground, and it did not get a chance to rot. So the carbon wasn't released to the, the atmosphere through decomposition. It didn't get burned, so it wasn't released through um, combustion. Instead, it was stored in the lithosphere for a very long time and out of the atmosphere. And by digging it out or pumping it out, we are adding all that carbon that was stored since, you know, before humans were around um, and adding that to our atmosphere. And we can see that this graph shows you the mustard color is land use change and the gray is um, fossil fuels and cement, which also has carbon in it. And you can see that these changes are very recent, right? As humans, we've been around a couple thousand years, but we really only started taking fossil fuels out of the ground since the industrial revolution. And it's in a very short period of time, we have just really had this enormous impact on our environment by taking carbon that was stored so that we could benefit from all that energy, right? It takes a little bit of energy or work to get that carbon out of the ground and it gives us much more energy. So you can see the benefit to humans, um, but with that has come in that same period of time when we put all the carbon into the air, 
we see the consequences of, of making that change. And this is an image of our atmosphere. And the atmosphere is just all the gases that are held to earth by gravity. And most of the gases in the atmosphere are nitrogen and oxygen, just a tiny trace and that's N2 and O2, right? So these are two molecule gases. And we just have a very small amount of gases that are what we call our greenhouse gases, like carbon dioxide. And they all have three molecules. So they're larger, they're um, three atoms, pardon. So they are larger molecules and they um, provide a very important function in our atmosphere in that they trap the sun's heat. And what, what happens is the, the small wavelength sunlight comes through the atmosphere through all the different gases when it hits the earth and is transformed to heat radiation, which is a longer wavelength and it's going back out towards space. Um, it gets trapped by these larger molecules causing them to vibrate and hold in that heat, which is really important because we don't have that, for example, on the moon and there is no life on the moon because we don't have that life-sustaining, um, heat-trapping atmosphere. But on the flip side, we, um, we've now put more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, and that is meaning, and here this is um, local data from Mauna Loa, and this is not a projection or an, an estimate. This is just a, observations collected um, at the summit of how much, um, CO2 is in the atmosphere. And you can see it's very squiggly. Every year it goes up and down. And that just reflects the low point when there's slightly less. That's in the summer when in the Northern hemisphere, all the trees and plants are growing and absorbing that, um, doing photosynthesis and absorbing some of the CO2. And then in the winter when their leaves fall off, then you get a little surge in the amount of CO2. But you can see that annual variation is nothing compared to this very steady increase that mirrors exactly when we started taking fossil fuels out of the ground and, and burning them and putting that into the atmosphere. And it, CO2 is not the only greenhouse gas, but it is the driver. It is by far the most common and it really drives the changes that we are seeing. So that's the cause. It's really quite simple. It's just an change in our carbon cycle that we have made, but the impact is extremely complicated. So we call it global warming, just means that the temperature is getting, is changing and getting warmer. And this is a representation of the last hundred years through colors, just showing that, um, or last 120 years, and we didn't always have thermometers measuring temperature, right? There was a time that thermometers didn't exist and they were invented. And before that, we know from um, core ice samples, tree rings, even coral, we can see growth rings over time and get an estimate of what the temperatures were like. And we know that in the thousand years preceding this time frame, the Earth's climate was quite stable. And that stability allowed us as humans to be farmers, right? Because you need that stability to know what to plant, when to plant, where to plant. And, um, and so we had this incredible period of time with a stable climate where our population was able to expand from a very small number to almost 8 billion because of our successful farming. Um, and that has been changing in the last 120 years. You can see there is a, an increase that doesn't go up every year. There's some variability year to year, but the general trend is just getting warmer. And what really matters more than the average that the previous slide was looking at averages is the very hot days, right? As you know, those of us that grew up here at, or wherever you grew up, you may be feeling it in your own lifetime, that change. I certainly do. So when I was a child, for example, in Hilo, although I was from Oahu, but um, in Hilo, you would have just a handful, maybe a week of very hot days over 90 degrees. Now you will have like a month and a half of very hot days over 90 degrees. And we all know how hard it is to teach children who are too hot to learn. 
It's also a health hazard, especially for elderly people and infants that have trouble regulating their body temperature because to regulate your body temperature, you actually increase your circulation. So your heart works a lot harder. And for very elderly people, that can be too much strain for them to increase their circulation that much. And then by the time uh, 2060, so another 40 years from now, we can expect three months of that very hot weather. So this is something that will definitely change our lifestyle. And this is local data. I have to say that the situation is much worse in other places. Being an island, we are actually very um, moderated. Our temperature is very moderated by the oceans around us that absorb so much heat. So other places will have much wilder swings between very hot summers and cold winters. So what some of the changes we see in the climate are direct changes, just directly caused by higher temperatures. So when it's hotter, you get more rain instead of snow and earlier snow melt. So in places, not here so much, but on the mainland, that means water doesn't get, um, isn't held in the system as long each year. So you have a much longer, drier center, summer. And then everywhere, including here, when it's hotter, water evaporates faster, so it just gets drier. And then you also get in increased transpiration. The trees and plants, they open up their stomata when the temperatures rise, and they let out more moisture. And this is actually a really good reason to plant trees, because that cools things down when they do that in the environment around them, which is why when you sit under a tree, it's not just the shade that cools you down, it's also that tree transpiring actually takes a little energy out of the atmosphere because um, it's a chemical reaction and cools us down. So that's a direct impact. Another direct impact is wildfires caused because it's hotter and it's drier. It makes forests more flammable. And, and again, you have a longer um, wildfire season in the summer. And this is something that obviously the We've seen so many huge fires across the West of the United States, but it's not just there. Here in Hawaii, we have actually seen more frequent flyers, um, fires as well, which is really unfortunate. Another effect is sea level rise. And now we're getting into indirect effects. So because it's hotter, the ice melts, and then we have um, you know, more water being added to our oceans. But the other thing that happens is Water, like many things, when their temperature is increased, you have thermal expansion. And so water actually gets bigger when it's hotter. And so those two things combined just lead to a rising sea level. And we can see that here in Hawaii. This is, again, just real measurements, no kind of projection for the future. And we can see that there's a huge variability with our tides, of course, but our higher tides are getting higher than they used to be. And just like the very hot days, it's not the average that matters, it's the extremes that matter. And, um, and here's an example of what happens with the extremes. So our higher tide and means our storm surges go in a little further inland. And so as a state that just brings up so many complicated issues, like are we going to protect private coastal property or are we going to lose our beaches? right? Because we need to let the beaches move inland if we're going to still have our beaches here in Hawaii. And it's also just very expensive. A lot of our roads run along the coastlines, our harbors. And so having to move or fortify those in different ways, um, sea level rise in is an extremely expensive thing for our state. Um, another effect that stems from the temperature is reduced winds and currents in the ocean. And the reason for that, this is what we saw before. This is temperatures, global temperatures changing, and but it doesn't change evenly. So these are two countries that are closer to the poles. And you can see that the pattern there compared to countries that are closer to the equator or actually straddle the equator is very different over time. The, the regions near the poles, started getting warm relative to themselves. We're not comparing um, the temperatures in Iceland to the temperatures in Ecuador. We're just comparing the change in temperature in Iceland to the change in temperature in Ecuador, right? So 
things started changing much earlier and much more dramatically near the poles. And this means that the difference in temperature between our poles and our equator, which is what drives our wind patterns, that difference, because the hot air rises, the cool air comes in from the poles and the hot air goes. So you get a cycle. And we experience that cycle here in Hawaii with our trained winds. That's just part of the cycle. But you might have also heard of like the jet stream and the Gulf Stream. So these are global wind patterns. Now that the difference is not as big as it used to be, those wind patterns are less consistent. And we feel that here in Hawaii, our trade winds, again, those of us that are a little bit older, we can feel the difference. We used to get in the 70s, when I was a little girl, we used to get um, trade winds almost all year, 291 days out of the year. And 10 years ago, it was down to just a little over 200 days. And it's probably fewer now today. I didn't, I didn't find any super current data. But so we are experiencing, you know, less trade winds. It's a huge boon for the air conditioning industry. But what we see on the surface with declining winds also happens underneath the water. So those winds push the surface of the ocean and they create these big currents that go and drive the underwater um, climate. And then the result of, of less winds above is also a less steady current beneath the ocean surface. And those changing currents have all kinds of impacts. The biggest one that we're seeing in the last few years is now the cold water that comes here from the Northeast arrives more slowly and it has time to warm up on the way here. So when it gets here, we have a much warmer ocean. So two things going on is just the air temperature is warmer. So that warms up the ocean a little bit, but also our changing currents, our slower currents. And so we've seen in the last six years, we've seen three major coral bleaching events which is something that we had never seen before here in Hawaii. So this is something really new and it's an indirect effect of our, of our warming oceans. And for those who might not be familiar, the coral bleaches because inside the coral polyp, which the coral is a living organism with lots of little polyps and each polyp hosts a, micro, a little algae, a zooxanthellae, and that algae provides the corals color, but it also provides most of the corals food, about 90% of the food. And when it gets quite warm, the algae starts becoming toxic to the coral and the coral ejects it. And so that's why it loses its color. And if the water temperature stays high for too long, then the coral will not take up new algae, which it is very capable of recruiting algae. Algae likes to live in coral. It's a great host environment for it. So if it stays warm too long, then the coral will die. If it's brief, then the coral can often rebound. But it certainly has a big impact on, you know, the when you lose your coral reefs, you lose all the marine life that require that coral um, to live. And obviously, small fish and then going up the feed food chain to people. And there are places where people really depend on food as a basic food source. And then you also um, have the issue of all that coral is made of calcium and carbon, right? Coral takes carbon out of the water. And if that coral can't survive, then it is not storing that carbon, that carbon there, which means you could get more in the atmosphere, which just yeah. makes our cycle more intense. Yeah, I read somewhere uh, that uh, we get uh, most of our oxygen from the coral. So that's okay. Why yeah, okay. I, I don't know. I, I just read somewhere. So yeah. okay. sorry to interrupt you. No, no problem. Um, so why do warmer oceans cause heavy rains and floods? So we've been seeing increased flooding um, here in Hawaii a little bit, right? A few years ago on Kauai, we had Halaiva flooding this last year for the first time ever. Waimanalo, which is near me, has flooded twice in the last four years. And these floods um, that are more dramatic, I have to say, on the mainland, um, Basically, your 100-year storm is becoming your almost every year storm at this point. And it's a very expensive situation to be in, to always be recovering from major storms and disasters. But these are tied to the, to the winds. The weaker 
atmospheric current. So this lower winds means that when a storm comes over land, it doesn't just keep moving on, raining a little bit each place as it goes. It will sit and just dump rain in one spot. The other thing is the warmer ocean means that warmer water evaporates faster. So as the storm's passing over to the ocean, it collects more water vapor. So when it hits land and opens up, there's more rain to fall. And then when you get sea level um, rise, the storm surges that you get with those storms created with all the wind and stuff will go a little bit further inland. So that's a reason that that is connected. The other effect, which I started to talk about a bit when we looked at the coral bleaching is ocean acidification. This is the CO2 um, graph that we had seen before. And the red line that runs through the middle of it is basically 57% uh, of the emissions, right? We, can, we have data on all the fossil fuels that are sold in the world every year and things like that. So we have pretty good, good numbers on what is being sold and used. And so we can see that it's a little under two thirds tracks exactly in line with what we're seeing in the atmosphere, which means that there's another, you know, another more, little more than a third that is going somewhere else. And they calculate that about 12% is going into land. You know, our plants having more CO2 is like a fertilizer for plants. So we have, even though we have deforestation, plants are taking in that CO2 like a fertilizer and some of it is being stored in land but even more of it is getting stored in the ocean. And so this is another part of the carbon cycle. So we looked at the land-based car um, carbon cycle, which had photosynthesis, consumption, respiration, and that happens in the ocean too, because in the ocean, we actually have more plants than on land with all the plankton and seaweed and algae that's in the ocean. And that there's a cycle going on in there that's very similar to the carbon cycle on land. But another thing that happens is CO2 diffuses. It just passes from the air to the surface of the ocean if it's in a higher concentration in the air or from the ocean to the air if there's a higher concentration in the ocean because nature likes a balance, right? So that diffusion happens until they are, they are even. And once it goes into the surface level of the ocean where it can easily go back and forth, some of it will go down into the deeper water and get stored there for thousands of years. So the ocean is a place that stores a lot of carbon. It also, um, it's taken up by the coral and shells, right? Um, corals that make their hard skeleton and creatures that make shells, they take carbon and calcium directly out of the ocean water for the building material for the coral skeleton or their shells. And so that stores a lot of carbon. And when they die and they um, end up as sediment on the ocean floor, they eventually become limestone, which is uh, where most of the carbon is stored in the lithosphere. And again, that carbon does not go in the cycle. It's tucked away, it's stored for long periods of time. But it turns out that when, in the same way that we saw the CO2 go up, you're seeing the same, same trend that you've seen before, the same data. We can track here the green they're measuring at Station Aloha, just 100 miles north of Oahu. They measure the carbon concentration in the water. And you can see that it is following the exact same trend of what we see in the air because of that diffusion between the ocean, uh, the ocean surface and the atmosphere. And what this blue line shows is the acidity, the pH. And it's counterintuitive, but um, basically, the, the more acidic it is, the lower the pH number the value is. And so we can see that it's getting more acidic directly related to more carbon in the ocean water because that um, CO2 combines with the H2O and it makes a carbonic acid, which is a weak acid, which isn't gonna hurt people, but makes it harder for those corals and shelled creatures to get the carbon out of the water to make their shells and skeletons. And this is an image of, this is not in the ocean, this is an experiment looking at the level of acidity that we might expect at the end of the century. And this is a sea butterfly, a little creature that's at the base of the food chain. And it's just showing how it, it actually disintegrates in that slightly more acidic water. And when you have things at the base of the food chain, 
that are not able to survive, then obviously that affects things all up the food chain, including humans at the top. So it becomes a problem for ourselves. So what can we do? And I'd like to, in all the lessons, have kind of a positive slant because you don't want to depress children. We don't even want to depress adults, right? We want people to feel that they understand the science and so they know what to do. And by understanding that it's about the carbon cycle, then when people, I have adults who are very well-meaning who will tell me, oh yes, I'm doing my bit. I'm not using plastic straws. And I, you have to say, hmm. So it's really a good thing not to use plastic straws, but that is not gonna solve this problem. That's gonna help with our plastic pollution problem, but that doesn't actually change you know, what's going on with, with climate change because how does that change the carbon cycle, right? So we, by understanding the science, we can think of things that actually will help. So the most important thing anyone can do is to vote green because the solutions really have to happen in the large scale, right? The problems we're in, individual actions are great, but we really need large scale um, actions at the public government level so that when everybody just plugs into the wall or turns on their light, it is 100% renewable energy that is being used to power that, whether you make an effort or not, right? So those are the big solutions. But while we're waiting for that, this just shows a little bit of here in the United States, what really, what really counts. So where we can get a bang for our buck, because we don't wanna be spending a huge amount of energy doing something that doesn't really have much of a benefit if we're motivated by wanting to reduce our carbon footprint. So if you look here, basically the things to target that really have a big bang are driving, whether it's driving less, whether it's driving um, something that's fueled by renewable energy, um, electricity, natural gas. This is really referring to heating on the mainland and we don't heat here. So this is really it. So if we focus on uh, you know, shifting our electricity and driving to either renewable energy or reducing it as much as we can being more efficient. And then within our diet, it's beef and dairy are the big kickers. So it's a kind of thing that if you like chicken teriyaki, every time you order chicken teriyaki instead of beef teriyaki, you had a much smaller carbon footprint meal. So these are the kind of things, and there's nothing extreme. It doesn't mean everybody needs to turn vegan, but if we know and we care, then those are things, choices that we can make. And cumulatively with everybody making those choices, of course, it will make a difference. So that's the biggest thing, reducing our, our, our carbon footprint there. And the other thing we can do is plant trees. And this is a picture at our project at Hamakua Marsh. These are middle school students who actually grew these koa seedlings from seeds. They germinated them as a different, a different science project in middle school. So anyways, I want to leave it at that um, for, for that part, just to, to make sure everybody feels they have a good understanding of what's going on in climate change. It's not about the future. Unless anyone's planning to kick the bucket tomorrow, it's definitely going to impact your lives as well. Unfortunately, it's not. People still like to say this is something we're leaving to our children or our grandchildren. It's like, nope. <laughs> It's happening now and the solutions have to happen now as well. And luckily our state takes it seriously and we are making movements towards um, you know, renewable power and slowly, much more slowly than that, moving towards renewable transportation. So that's good that we're in an environment that the kids can feel empowered and hopeful because there are a lot of positive changes going on. And hopefully the more they understand it and the more our teachers understand it, the more everybody will demand those changes so that we keep them moving forward. Everyone, this is Laren Lerma. I wanna introduce her to you. She's a fifth Hi, grade teacher, science teacher, science and math teacher over at Kaohao Elementary. And we started a long time ago in the dark ages, yeah, Lauren? <laughs> yes, Lauren and I go way back. And um, thank you, Lauren, for the introduction. And 
Um, thank you for allowing me to be here and just share a little bit about my experience. I know you guys have a full um, afternoon, um, but as Lorna was sharing, I am a fifth grade math and science teacher at Kaohao Public Charter School, um, which is situated in Kailua, formerly known as Lanikai Elementary. Um, we have been partnering with Healthy Climate Communities since I believe 2015. I don't know if Lisa, Dr. Martin is um, present here today, but um, we have been working with the or nonprofit organization um, in just serving the community in which we call home and the place that we live in and reside in. And in 2000, I believe 19, when the NGS um, science standards were first implemented fully in Hawaii, um, she proposed um, her and I working together as her being the scientist and me being the educator. Um, together, we kind of piloted a program that she developed um, and I just went for it with my kids being fully um, kind of ready and eager to learn more, not only about the NGSS standards, but also about how I could implement and integrate um, a real life problem for students living in the community and how they could then be servants to the community through a curriculum that was so directly tied to um, Hawaii and this place. So. Um, I can go on and on about the experience that we shared and just a little side note, this is the same year that COVID also, you know, changed everything the way we live and teach and um, all of it. So it was prior to all of those changes um, that I was implementing the program with my students for the first time. Um, one benefit was that Dr. Martin was able to actually implement some of the lessons with my students. So I got to observe her and her, you know, strengths as um, with her science background and I being of an educator first, um, getting to give her insight on what I thought were the strengths of the program and what things I thought, um, you know, could be improved on as um, the mind of a fifth grader, a 10 year old, much different than a professional scientist. So, a lot, you know, a lot of fine tuning and what you will find out about the program are so many wonderful things. I just kind of wanted to share um, three things that I know I benefited in the students in my class who got to experience the program also benefited from um, the obvious. It's directly tied to the next generation science standard. Um, as a teacher who is always trying to find creative ways to present material and then assess student learning um, and give that immediate feedback. I appreciated the fact that every lesson is tied to an, a rubric which um, students could benefit from because they could see it and they, it was all very um, clear for them. And so that was something that um, as a teacher, I didn't have to reinvent the wheel. Every lesson was tied to an engineering standard, a disciplinary core idea and those cross-cutting concepts. Um, so that for me was a strength for sure of the program. Um, the second was the tie to the Native Hawaiian culture. Um, as a Native Hawaiian myself, as a, play, as a person who grew up on the islands, um, that to me really strung a chord in what we try to do, not only at my school as a public charter school and a school that really values Hawaiian culture and practice, um, I really did feel like it benefited all the students in my class. Um, specifically at the charter school I work at, we um, do serve a good portion of our student body is military. Um, so it was a way for me to integrate Hawaiian um, place names, Hawaiian native species. Um, in one lesson, I believe lesson two, you're giving names to the different winds um, in the windward side of Oahu. And um, that was all new for a lot of the students who never heard that, you know, there's different wind names for the different parts of the island. And I love the fact that we could integrate Hawaiian culture and um, values into a science curriculum um, valuable classroom time, you know, there because we could integrate multiple um, standards. So that was another strong benefit for me. Um, and lastly, I think what really resonated with students is the service to community. Um, we ended the unit with a field trip to Hamakua Marsh, where we actually planted trees, learned about endangered native species, the plants, the birds, um, and Dr. Martin was a part of that. And the students now, years later, um, can go back to a place where they actually planted seeds and now can see the kind of benefits of what they did um, through their service project. So, um, you know, there's so much to offer, but I think you guys 
are going to learn more about all the different parts of it. But for me, those are three big um, kind of takeaways. And I think your students in which you teach will also benefit from those um, strengths of the program. So um, I think you are in store for a big treat here. Um, any questions for me? I know you guys have a lot to cover. So they're going to give me five, 10 minutes max. So any questions or anything you would like to know more about just from a Someone who's in your shoes and another teacher in the classroom. We started um, as a school uh, with with Mr. Ganier, um, you know, a school at Shoni Poco. We started planting okia. And would that count, even though we did it prior? Because I know you mentioned, was that one of the lessons to plant trees? It was um, kind of like the um, performance task that is mentioned in many of the NGSS standards. Um, okay. I don't think it would hinder them, their learning process if they've already planted the trees because they learn about the carbon cycle and the value of trees um, in the community. So I, I and Dr. Martin, might we can speak more on that. I don't think it would take away any part of the learning for them, um, especially maybe if you just enrich because they've already have that connection. Um, okay. And for our school, we are walking distance to Hamakua Marsh. So that was part of it. I'm um, going to a local watershed. Um, and it's something that I know is close and dear to Dr. Lisa Martin. And um, it was something that our, our school has already invested in. And so, um, you know, the students in my class, oh yeah, my brother or sister did that, you know, when they were in fifth grade. Um, so it was something that was also very comfortable and something that we could manage. So I think whatever works for you, if you can, you know, make the connection to something you guys already done, that prior knowledge, I think can only strengthen um, the learning throughout the unit. So um, definitely, I think it, it would benefit more than, you know, take away from anything. Uh, Larry? Yes. Um yeah, hi. Uh, I was just wondering, uh, so uh, you took five lessons from this unit mm -hmm. and what is the transition like? Uh, so how, how did you plan your transition from one lesson? What lesson should come? You know, like, I mean, I'm just trying to see your planning style for the unit. Yeah, and, um, you know, I'm going to hopefully my memory served me well. It was in 2019 when I implemented COVID, you know, changed a lot of the things we did. Um, but um, that was part of the fine tuning that Dr. Martin and I did, uh, trying to find ways to transition from each lesson. Um, one thing we did find out is the allocated time, which was in the pilot program, um, wasn't enough. I remember the second lesson when the that lesson was really based on a lot of research using technology. Um, the students, I think it was allocated for like one class session. I needed three. Um, because I also had to teach the technology, how to use the information and then how to transition that to um, something that a fifth grader could make sense of. Um, but that was, um, sorry, is it Sivithia? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, that yeah. was a, a challenge for me. And I think that's true for all subject matter we teach and there's just not yeah. enough minutes in the day. Mm -hmm. um, so what I thought I could accomplish in, um, five weeks, it really took much longer. Um, mm -hmm. But it almost for me was, a, it's the cost and benefits, right? Because they were more in, you know, deeping, they're thinking about the questions and the research. It only added to what they came out of it. I, I think if it was rush, the valuable things that were kind of learned through um, the experience totally uh, like outweighed what, you know, what time we had in the class. Um, but, you know, I think as a math science teacher, we know that, you know, math, the ELA gets more of the time in yes. class, instructional minutes. So it was very challenging. And I know at Kaohao for fifth grade, they get science twice a week for 45 minutes. And I know some schools maybe even less than that. Um, so I really had to kind of um, just be mindful and let the students kind of direct how much time we spend on which lesson. Some we were able to fly by a little quicker. Um, we have a great Hawaiian studies teacher at our school who was able to support me in some of that um, cultural connections, um, but it will differ from, you know, what the time you have and how much you can invest in it. Um, but it's definitely worth um, the time spent on it. So, you know, it honestly, what that was a challenge for me. And I shared that with Dr. Martin, like, oh no, we're still here because 
they needed more time to do this. Um, and, you know, the reliance on technology. We had students sharing devices, which also is true for many schools if you're not in a one-to-one -one program. Um, so that was something that we had to work around, but definitely worth, you know, the challenges that we overcome, so. Yeah, so Great time question. is a factor. I know, I mean, like you said, yeah, um, none of, most of the schools, their focus is mostly on uh, reading and math, but um, I try to squeeze in my science during the reading block also. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so. And I do that too, especially with the informational text, if they yes. can use, you know, literature based in the fields of science, but also so practice informational text reading. So did you do any kind of extended pro um, uh, projects like a, a citizen science for these lessons? I didn't. I pretty much stayed to the curriculum um, okay. as I wanted to be as helpful for um, Lisa as much as possible. So using what she designed, um, okay. you know, okay. there, I think there's room for individualization, you know, in the classroom. So you're, you can meet the needs of your students. Um, but I, when I use the program, really just try to implement the lesson as it was designed. Yeah, because what Lisa was talking about the uh, sea level rise and stuff, uh, I mean, I have done some projects with them, like a hands-on. So it really like uh, helped me to remember, I did like uh, three, four years ago, and uh, it just brought me back all those memories. So I was just thinking if I could just have those as models, mm -hmm. um, yeah, you know, integrated into this unit. Yeah, thanks, sorry, I didn't. I no, didn't... no, no, that was a great question. Laren, I have a question for you. Um, yeah. The content of this unit is hard, right? It's yes. complicated stuff. And um, can you talk about how your fifth graders did with this, you know, pretty complex science? Um, I know Lisa and I, we had conversations about that. Um, what I found was I was pleasantly surprised how much they were willing um, to just invest in what they didn't know and what um, they could use um, as an opportunity for growth, right? And an opportunity in that growth mindset. I know it's it's all, you know, in education is what we're trying to instill in our students. Um, but I think I had more fears about it than they did themselves. And I think that's true of a lot of our students. They will rise to any bar we set for them. Um, the biggest challenge for them, I know, was some of the websites that are not as student friendly. Um, and I forget the name of the website where we were using GPS. Um, and Lisa, I don't know, I think that's in lesson two. Um, that for them was most challenging because a lot of it I felt was information presented for adults on the website itself. Um, but once they went through that learning curve, like that was a lesson where I think I was referring to earlier, I thought I could do it in a day, but we ended up spending three days on it because once that first day of, you know, trying to make sense of what they were um, reading, we needed a day just to make sense of the information that was being presented. But once they got through that, they got really excited at being able to make sense of it all. But at first there was a little bit of, oh, I don't get this. Um, and we were able to overcome that, which I think there's also something to say about that. Like, yeah, it's not always gonna be so straightforward or easy, but we can problem solve, we can develop strategies of working together. And I think that when I um, did partner them up, knowing that it was gonna be a little bit more challenging and um, than the use of technology. We didn't have one-to-one -one devices at the time. Um, we do now, but um, that was one way we kind of worked through it, is just giving them more time to um, learn the material, learn how to use the resource, um, and then everyone was successful in the end. I think, La Lauren, I think uh, scaffolding is important too, you know, like uh, you can give them that open-ended question just to get their uh, knowledge of what they know and, you know, bring their background information to the class, things, what they're learning um and providing them some kind of questioning so i think um uh challenging science class is the best because uh they learn the best through those challenges that's what i have felt uh in my science classes so um, right no and i totally agree and it was my own fear of 
oh no, you know, I mean, they were gonna be able to be successful in finding it. And we were, and the only, you know, change I made to the lesson was just providing more time. It was just a simple, um, you know, just a need of more time to use the program and um, be able to finish the task. Are there any more questions for Laren? She is a unique resource that we will not have um, on future <laughs> lessons. So please don't hold back if you have any questions for someone that has taught this twice, um, has gone through the experience. And feel free, you know, Lorna can share my contact information. Um, you know, I'm like you the folks, you know, willing and always, always available to help. We are all very busy, but I, I really um, believe in the program and I believe in the value of bringing you know, science to the students in a way that they can connect with. And um, especially through the Hawaiian culture and um, the values that are kind of connected through every lesson. And it's, um, it, it will be something you will have to see in your class and see the beauty of it because it is really um, you need to see the kids, you know, just ones who don't know Hawaiian words or meanings of different winds and they leave talking about it. So um, thank you, Dr. Lisa, for letting me be a part of it and for Lorna for inviting me to share. And as I said, if I ever have questions, um, Lorna, feel free to pass my email along. I'll be helpful to help as much as I can. <laughs> I'm sorry. Right. Last question. A what was question something? Oh, yeah, sorry. go ahead. Sorry. I no, no, no. <laughs> um, I had a quick question. So you did take this course before, yeah? No, I haven't. And oh, I was just gonna say, can you share your portfolio? I don't know. <laughs> no, there, there was no course. She, Laren just dove in and taught it. Oh. Um, she was the first one to pilot it, and then she taught it oh. again the next year. And hopefully, the second year it was much easier. Yeah. But she didn't <laughs> have the benefit of a course though I was available if she had questions, um, but yeah. Yeah, so I, I kind of was the guinea pig. I just dived right in and tried it out and um, you know, fell in love with it. And um, I think you will too. So, sorry, I don't have a portfolio to share. <laughs> and Lauren did make some changes and that's something that I would be excited for all of you folks to do, um, you know, is change things to what makes sense for you. You're the best judge of what could work in your classroom. And yeah, and that's not a problem. Lauren, what was something your, I mean, students really liked about those lessons? I mean, something I'm thinking so that way, that from that I can catch them. I just want to compare. Well, you know, I know they, like my first thought was okay the field trip right but kids like field trips for obvious reasons um but that's what they still talk about you know um that's what resonated with them and i think that's what i hear from their parents like oh you know they had so much fun um and it was also something that parents could be a part of um correct me if i'm wrong dr martin i remember we opened it up on weekends where it became a part of the family you know, the family learning and providing um, an opportunity for parents to be a part of the curriculum and students then taking the role of teacher and teaching to their parents. But I know that was one lesson that really resonated with them. It's just um, now, okay, we know that we know there's a problem. What can we do about it? And we can actually be part of the solution. Um, that was, you know, I think for many of them, like the life changing kind of like, oh, I can make a difference. I don't have to just sit back and watch. I can actually do something about this. Um, so that I know was really something that for many of them um, is something they remember, you know, so anything that sticks in the memory, I think is what we can, we hope for that they are a little different, their little, their mindset is maybe changed about something or they act in the way they do things and the way they, um, you know, just their lifestyle changes because of it. So I think that was, you know, eye opening for many of them. Oh, well, thank you. I appreciate everyone letting me share. And again, if there are questions um, along the way, I'd be happy to share um, from my experience. But um, thank you again and good luck to everyone. 
Hands Thank you, Lauren. You know, PD Thanks, Lauren. after a long day of work. Oh. This is just our curriculum. And healthy climate communities, we do different things just as a to back up. One is the um, community forestry on the um, watershed of Hamakua Marsh. We work with community groups. We work with a lot of school groups. And just as an aside, um, Lauren was kind of confounding the two things because um, her students did both. But this is not actually part of the curriculum. Doing the field trip is not part of the curriculum and it, it doesn't, it's doing a field trip is not a required part of the curriculum. You can definitely take that experience and, you know, and do a field trip and that field trip will be more meaningful for, you know, different reasons that the kids would have had that background, but it's not actually part of it. We also do workshops in schools and some of the um, stuff that we include in the workshops um, got used in some of the units, um, in some of the lessons, things that I found, you know, easier ways to teach kids. We do an Arbor Day art exhibit where kids draw why they love trees and we exhibit them. And then the last is the NGSS curriculum units. And that's what we're looking at today. So on the website, you guys will have full access to all the materials on the website already. So you can look through. So it's at healthyclimatecommunities.org and maybe um, Lauren, uh, Lorna can put that in the chat. But basically what you'll see just looks like this and you'll go to the elementary fifth grade one and it has a teacher guide right there um, and you can look at it and download it. Um, it has a student workbook and the student workbook is PDF. If you folks wanna make changes to it, you can let me know and I can give you a document, something that you can edit and change, right? Um, it, then it, it may not come out looking quite as nice as the PDF, but it will be the right thing for your classroom to use. So yeah, so that we can work with that. And some people might want to find, I can still have materials in a, in a way that you can amend them. And then I have um, slideshows just to either in PowerPoint or Keynote that you could use to guide class discussion. And again, this is something that you can edit super easily on your own in the format that it's already in. And that is something that um, I'm not thinking it is exactly the way you will want it, but it will save you time and effort to start from something rather than starting from nothing, right? Um, so this, these are the standards that are covered in the unit. So lessons one, two, three cover the um, earth materials and systems. The, these are, for those of you that aren't familiar, actually I should get a show of hands. Is everybody familiar with NGSS already pretty much? Okay, great. So yeah, so the, the disciplinary core ideas are kind of like the content, I think of it. It's like what you're teaching about. And so we spend three lessons on one of them. And then lesson four goes to human impacts on earth systems. And lesson five is the engineering design task where you're designing something. And the, the, um, the performance expectation, we follow it exactly, right? So it's not like, am I teaching this standard? It is exactly the standard. Um, so the performance expectation for the first three lessons is to develop a model using an example to describe ways the geosphere, biosphere, hydrosphere, and or atmosphere interact. So to get there, that's pretty hard, which is why it takes us three lessons to get there. First, they have to learn what these spheres are and what they do in them, of themselves. And then we get to how they interact with each other, right? So it takes, it takes a couple lessons to, to pull that off. But we also, along the way, do a lot of the science and engineering practices and the cross-cutting concepts. And I have to tell you that this was not hard. It was so easy because I actually really like NGSS and the cross-cutting concepts and the science and engineering practices really are um, what scientists use, right? So the, the patterns, the skill sets are very logical and they, it's, they're easy to, to fit in well in the lessons. One of the things we do is we use an NGSS vocabulary, right? They don't just want you to teach things. They want you to use the right vocabulary so the kids know those words and what it really means. So for example, we're learning about systems, earth systems, and we will have in there the vocabulary of what a system is. And so they can learn that and they can use the right words. 
The same thing for a model, right? What is a model? And they will understand that all these different ways, when we look at the, um, through the lessons, we are using so many different types of models and we want to know that they're all model, right? A model is just a simplified representation um, of some, some part of the universe to make it easier to understand something. And we will use, um, for example, you know, some models are like a picture, some models are an experiment. And so they can know what those models are and that it, it is a model. Um, we also, um, it was very easy to integrate Nahopana Ao, right? So some of the Hawaiian standards are in there because whenever you make it place-based and focus on local things, they just come naturally. And um, we do have integrated for many of you are teaching work closely with another teacher to do you know, English and math and social studies. And so the option is to integrate these. So we do have English um, options, math options. Some of it is extension would be extra and you may choose to do it. You may not choose to do it and that's fine. But especially with the math, I couldn't help myself. I just, um, it lent itself to things and I thought, wouldn't it be neat if, it could, if the students were learning fractions with this material. And so it would be more meaningful. So that is totally optional. Um, so I'm just gonna briefly go through the five lessons and then what we're going to do in future um, lessons together is we are going to actually do the lesson so that you don't have to um, wonder what's gonna happen in your classroom. We will have done it together. So you don't have to do outside reading or prep or understand what it is. We just go through the lessons. If there's an experiment, we do the experiment together um, via Zoom, obviously. And then that way you actually have done it and you can just repeat it in your class or adapt it for your class before you repeat it. So the first, each one, it's is very NGSS. We have a driving question for each lesson. And then we start with a phenomenon. And so the driving question for the first one is what earth systems are present in our Ahupua'a? And we start with our, um, our phenomenon is observing basically um, a, a model of the water cycle by watching condensation happen in a plastic bag. So it's just a, a bowl of, of hot water, very hot water in a plastic bag and you put ice on top and you watch the steam and the condensation which mimics the water cycle with rain and stuff. And so that's one model. They're also going to fill in a model and I have a friend who's an artist that made these cute drawings so that they would again feel local because when you look on the internet for materials, they don't look very much like they're from here. Um, so that's a way that they're gonna learn. We also um, you know, use real things. So they're learning about the lithosphere and they can see how it is formed in Hawaii. So you have you know, a video. So we try to use things that they can relate to whether it's a hands-on model uh, local images or, or actual, you know, artifacts that are happening in our world. The second lesson, and this is the one that um, Laren mentioned, took three class sessions for her to do. Um, and although I think actually now that the kids are better at technology, that was a little bit before kids were using so much technology, um, it might be easier now. But um, it says, what can I learn about my ahupua'a from maps and names? And the phenomenon we start with is that maps showed the world from above, even when people could only see the world from the ground. So this is an old map of Hawaii. This is even before air balloons. There, nobody had flown in an airplane yet. And yet, what we hope the students will discover you know, the, the NSS way is to wonder, you have a phenomenon, you don't tell them the answer, they wonder, they make guesses and there's no right or wrong um, guess because they're just wondering. And, and what we hope they come to understand after doing the lesson is that from above you can see patterns and it helps you understand the land when you can see those patterns from above. And so we look at two parts in this lesson. One is a GIS map. And again, this is what Laren was talking about um, earlier. 
and it is for adults, right? These are actually all of the data used in the lesson is real data and where possible it's as up to date. And so this is the same stuff that scientists are using. And I don't see any reason that the kids shouldn't have the best available data. And the GIS maps, even though they're made for adults, I think that kids um, do get exposed to all of this much earlier than we did. And um, one accommodation could be for the teacher to guide the students through it as a demonstration rather than have the kids do it themselves, right? So that would be a possible accommodation if, if um, it was a more, if it seemed too challenging for your particular group of students. So, um, so we learned, we basically were looking at the earth systems in the Ahupua'a through GIS map layers, and it helps understand why the Ahupua'a ended up the shapes that they are, right? How they, how they ended up being the way they are, which is a very logical thing. So we do have this real uh, map with layers. And basically there's instructions on what to click on to get different, to get the map to show up different things. And then we have a worksheet where it basically is a series of questions, tells them what to go look at, what to click. And then there's a, a question to kind of guide their, their um, exploration. So they're not just randomly looking at pictures, but it guides them to think about each layer, what they're looking at. They're looking at rainfall, they're looking at elevation, they're looking at plant life, all the different um, types of, of information that we have about our ahupua'a. And the good thing is they can go down to the level of their own ahupua'a, wherever it is, outer island, um, neighbor island as well as Oahu, and they can look at places they know, right? They can recognize land features that are familiar to them because of a lake or a shoreline or a mountain. So that's that one. And the second part is, is learning about um, the local uh, mo'olelo that is local. And I do provide some generic ones in case you can't find one that applies to your ahupua'a and the Hawaiian names of the places and the rains and the winds in your ahupua'a. And I do provide resources where you can find that as well. Um, you know, there are, there, are, there are places that just have all those listed. And then that way the kids can understand that they had those names, those specific names for each place because that was so important to the Hawaiian people that were living off that land and depended on those resources. Um, and then the third lesson is how do earth systems interact in my ahupua'a? So this is the last part of that standard. And we look briefly at a physical interaction. And basically this, this looks at why, why is it wetter on the windward side of all the islands, right? Why are the windward sides wet and the leeward sides dry? And so they look at the interaction between the atmosphere or the winds and the hydrosphere or the rainfall and to understand that phenomenon. And then, and all of these I have, you know, I, I got images of real, again, real images from great weather apps of our real hurricanes that happened to be passing through when I was making this curriculum. So they can be looking at real weather, what it looks like um, in our islands. And then the next one is a lot more complicated and probably goes beyond what the NGSS standard makers were, but it allows us to teach climate change at this in this grade. And so we're looking at another interaction, which is the chemical reactions, which is the carbon cycle. And the carbon cycle is complicated. So they get three shots to learn about it. We have a very brief video, which says everything, but nobody can absorb everything in four minutes. So it's kind of an overview of the concept. And then they fill in this model, right? And parts of it will be familiar. The concept will be familiar because they will have just done the water cycle, which is an easier, smaller part, you know, cycle than this. But we go through this and there is, you know, instructions how to walk them through this complicated model. And to my surprise, as part of her test at the end of the unit, Laren gave them this blank model and had them fill it in and they could do it, which shocked me. But yeah, so they, because they went through each thing one at a time, 
they understood it enough that it didn't seem overwhelming, um, they, they could do it. Um, and then the third, the third at the very same concepts, we have the video, we have that paper model, and then they do an interactive model where they are being the different spheres and the carbon is, in this case, it's tennis balls and the carbon sinks where carbon is stored is buckets. But in your classroom, it doesn't have to be tennis balls. It can be anything that you have a lot of, right? It could be crayons. It can be anything that there is a lot of the same thing. And again, there's um, instructions that walk you through it and we'll do it together um, to give them one last go to reinforce for everybody how the carbon cycle works. And the, the fourth lesson is what are the negative effects of human interference in the carbon cycle and how they can be reduced. So this is human, this is this standard is a new standard and it's looking at basically negative human impacts on ecosystems. And so this one looks at the what happens with us putting more carbon in the um, in the atmosphere. And we start with warmer air temperature. And there are direct impacts that come from that. And then there's some very indirect impacts that come from that. And so there's a series of short videos that they watch that are actually super cute to learn about the different cause, cause basically causal chains, how, how this impacts us. And then this is an English part where they read two very, very short articles of just a couple paragraphs each about some of the local solutions. And here, this is part of not depressing them, but letting them know right away that even though there are these negative impacts, we are working on it as a society and they can help work on it too. Um, and then the last one is this um, engineering design task where they don't actually plant any trees, though they could certainly go back to a tree planting that they did, which I love that you folks did that. And, and somehow bring that in. But what they do is they design a tree planting. And so the standard is pretty specific. The standard asks them to, to design something and it needs to, they need to use criteria and respect constraints. And so this is exactly what they do. With all the standards, we just take it very literally and do exactly what the standard asks for. And so they are basically um, trying to create a, ple a tree planting that will store a certain amount of carbon. And they're given options of trees with how much carbon each of those trees would store over a 20 year period. So they do a little bit of math, some simple math with that. And then they make criteria. They have to choose their priority for trees or for watershed protection, for biodiversity or for economic benefits. And then they have to use constraints from their own ahupua'a, which trees will actually grow there. And they can see that from the cards and um, how far the trees need to be apart given where they're gonna, the location they're gonna be growing, et cetera. So they go through those constraints and criteria. They pick, they look at the cards and they pick the right combination of trees for them. And then um, there's two ways in the lesson, you folks can come up with your own way as well. But one way to do the design is using iTree Design, which is an online platform, which is pretty cool. And you can go, you can GPS it anywhere, right? So this is, this is the school that Loren works at. So you can go to your school grounds and do it through GPS on your own school grounds or what she actually did, she didn't choose to use that, instead, somebody in her school made her this map and they just hand drew them in on the map. So you can choose how you do it. But basically they're designing a tree planting. They're not actually doing the tree planting. So those are the lessons. And I know it seems like a lot because it is a lot. And it is um, in some ways, that's a good thing because it covers a lot of standards and um, teaches the kids a lot of information. And it, it you know, they think um, your learning experience, right? It would take several weeks to teach it. And so those would be your lessons for several weeks. Um, so do you have any questions or comments? I'm gonna look in the, I'm gonna look in the chat first.
Um, okay, so if somebody comes up with a local Hawaii footprint, I noticed Judy was putting in the chat, please share it with me. I would love to have that. Um, and our local footprint would be different because we don't have that heating factor. That would be the biggest difference probably. Um, okay, so this is one of the things that I wanted to make clear when you understand the, the, the carbon cycle, just like I mentioned the plastic change culture is going to be a very, very small part of the solution, right? It's really about keeping uh, fossil fuels in the ground and then restoring or protecting our forests. Those are the big, big, big impacts we can have. With agriculture, local agriculture, agriculture is, a, is not a sink, right? It doesn't store carbon. Agriculture is a source. Um, carbon is created by agriculture, right? We clear forests to plant farms and we harvest every season, which means we're taking whatever was grown out of the soil, we're not storing that carbon. There are definitely better and worse ways to farm in terms of carbon. And there's a lot of interest in regenerative agriculture now, and it would store more carbon, but I don't want people to miss, or students to mistakenly think that that is a real solution to climate change. As, as cool as it is, and I have my own home garden, I compost, so I'm not, I'm not down on the concept or how important it is environmentally. I'm just saying that we don't want, when we understand the carbon cycle, we look at that, that wouldn't really have a big impact on storing carbon or stopping the flow of carbon into our atmosphere. Um, unless they wanna do a tree garden, if they wanted to do a, like um, a tree garden, you know, plan, yeah, that would that would store carbon longer term. Um, so the last one, there's Melissa asked, that's the engineering design aspect of NGSS. Yeah, that's the designed one. The last lesson is creating the tree planting. And yes, so I just want to be specific that it's they don't have to actually plant the trees. They have to design a tree planting because every kid will come up with their own design, right? And so it would be nice though, and this is something that I'm working on separately through the DOE to have more trees at schools. You know, as it gets hotter, we will want more trees on campus so that the kids can still hang out and play outside just for the shade and cooling benefit. And it'd be great if you have designed your tree planting to learn about, you know, learn the skills that NGSS wants them to learn. That will teach them the importance of trees and we'll have them thinking about it. And then if the DOE has a program to plant more trees, if you end up as a class together planting a new tree on your campus or going out to care for an existing tree or measuring an existing tree or anything to do with existing real trees, you know, that, that brings more meaning to that activity. But it doesn't mean that you need to go out and plant five trees per student because they made the design, you know, that they spent one class doing their design. Because when you plant a tree, it's a lot of work to take care of it. So um, it better be a wanted tree. Um, yeah, but that is something that I, I am hoping the DOE um, puts more resources into um, planting more trees on schools. And one thing that they are very interested in, in speaking to them about that, is how it can be combined with curriculum and student learning in a lot of different ways. Um, obviously, not, not just this curriculum. But um, all right. So please feel free to just unmute. And I'd love to hear your comments, questions, apprehensions, anything. I had a quick question, sorry, and, and you probably already said this. We can find the portfolio where? Is it under a Google Classroom format? Or yes, yeah, so Melissa, now that I have all of your emails, I'm going to create a Google Classroom for the course, and I'm going to populate it with that portfolio template. So use this time from now till the next class and sort of start building the shell for the portfolio. Um, because the next time we meet, Lisa is going to roll out 
how to teach lesson one and lesson two. Yeah. So um, is that correct, Lisa? So they can yeah, that, that is the goal. And yeah. look at the materials on her website. So you can kind of already know what's yeah. coming. Um, and then I can I can have the template set up so at least you can start putting in the headlines and that sort of thing. Oh, good. So you'll have the portfolio template already. Okay. Yeah. Right. Okay. Right. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, Sabita. Um, yeah. So right now we are just uh, planning how we are going to implement the lessons. Though we can create a pacing and those kind of things, right? And until we meet next session, or we can teach. Or do we need to get prior approval from you? How we um, you, you, you don't need prior approval. Um, I designed them for teachers to be able to do independently, but I do realize that it's a lot to it's it's a lot of work for teachers to absorb the be able to teach it. And so my goal with this class was to make it so that we do the lesson together and therefore you know the lesson and you don't have to take any more time than to just teach it. Mm -hmm. um, there's not a lot of materials needed, but um, you know, mostly it's just paper printed out, which you folks all have access to mm -hmm. on the website. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so that was my goal is to the next time we meet, would be to go through lesson one and two together so that you don't oh. have to, not that you you have the teacher guide as, yeah. as needed, oh. but the idea is that you don't have to figure it out yourself. Hmm. We just do it together and you're like, oh yeah, okay, I did that. So I could do that again with my kids. Um, so that is my goal. I haven't done this before. So, <laughs> so I, I hope I meet my goal. Um, so, but the, the goal was to do the two, two lessons, the first class, because you folks will not have any feedback yet necessarily, right? You will not have taught anything. And then in the subsequent classes together, it will just be one lesson, uh, the next one, because you will, will use part of the time for you folks to reflect on your experience teaching those two lessons and to talk amongst yourselves, right? Yeah. And then the fourth lesson we'll do the next time again, with feedback from how the third lesson went. And then, no, fourth and fifth we'll do the next time and feedback from the third lesson. And then the last time will just be feedback and, and you folks, you know, talking about how things went, how I can improve the curriculum or have adapt, you know, adaptations. Um, you know, Laren's class is, was not a gifted class, right? It's just regular DOE, but, okay it is not a sped class and it is fifth grade. And okay. so if there are adaptations or you say, you know what, this concept was too hard for my students, but I decided that this was interesting and still was a useful thing for them to learn and a way to meet the standard, I chose this section of it. I'd love to learn that because then I can offer that up on my website. I can have adaptations available to other teachers. So they won't have to do what you're doing in this class and you know, do the work of figuring out how to adapt. You'll have adapted it. And if it's okay with you, then I will share that. Lisa, I have a question. Um, so mm -hmm. do you guys have any virtual field trip? Because I know uh, our school is not allowing uh, yeah. for any uh, field trips, yeah? Um, I was just thinking like if we can have a virtual field trip experience for our students for, do you have any contacts or anything? Um, you know, to do a virtual reality trip for my site, which again has nothing to do with this particular NGSS course, huh. but um, to learn where we have our field trips to learn about the birds and the native plants. Mm -hmm. um, techn technologically, it's a little bit tricky, <laughs> meaning that we put so much good stuff in there that it loads really slowly sometimes. But um, so I do have that resource I could share with you, but it's it's not the same as students going and getting their hands dirty. And I would say even going into your own school grounds uh -huh. to mess around in the dirt would be better than watch than looking at my virtual reality field trip. Yeah, no, um, we have yeah. a stream project in our school. Um, so uh -huh. I think I just had to get approval from our uh, principal. I, I hope, uh, I mean, I am sure he yeah. will because we are doing some stream projects. So um, yeah. yeah, but I was just thinking, 
in addition to it, if they can get some kind of virtual. Yeah, uh, I, I'm sorry that they're not doing other field trips yet. So a lot of schools are. But um, but yeah, I would say that if you're able to go on campus and find find stuff on campus, um, somebody asked, Rachel asked, so the tree planting they're planning is at our school specifically, or can they choose anywhere in our aqua? They can choose anywhere you want, right? Yeah, it's that's fine. Yeah, anywhere that is that is good to you, and if it's a place, hopefully it's a place that that's meaningful to them for some reason. I pick the school ground because the kids all know it, right? Every kid in the class would know it. But if there's a place that you have habitually gone for some other project or purpose that is meaningful to them, yeah, go go nuts. <laughs> so you know, fifth grade, uh, we have a state testing in science, yeah. So this is one of the biggest chunk in the testing i don't really? know how much percentage so yeah i'm so i i just love this unit i think um we need to i mean if we can just plan and align to whatever i mean uh, of course testing is also part of the uh, thing nowadays for all the schools so i was just thinking what how much percentage of that maybe we can make it more critical thinking for the students uh some you know like some questions we can just modify it for make it more open ended or I think it's already very open ended for the students, but I was just thinking more. Cool. Does anyone it's time to wrap up does anyone have a next year. I'm just so excited. I think nope. I okay. love it so much. Oh, thank thanks, thanks. Oh, I'm really excited. Sorry about that. Yeah. So, anyways, I really appreciate your participation. I'm excited too. Um, and Lorna will email everybody, so you will have those resources. And um, I just hope everybody has a great holiday. And you know, we have a natural break now. I didn't want to. I wanted to keep the flow going once we really started. But we'll, you know, our plan will be to to do the lessons at the, you know, the first part of the year. And obviously, exactly when you do them is up to you. And um, and we just know that we are incredibly flexible and want to be incredibly supportive. And I have never taught young kids, but but Lorna has. And so she is here to support you folks in any way. 